This conference will now be recorded. Okay, first of, all, first of all, I'm going to explain a little bit about what is Lunch and Learn and, and why we're doing it. And I want to really explain what you expect to see because this is uh, a lot of work's gone into these sessions and they are very regular. And I want you to think, you know, if you can see that, keep that space for yourselves on, on a Tuesday, it would be brilliant. And, and let's just put it into perspective the PWI is an ongoing organization. It's, it's continuously reviewing what we do, reviewing the challenges within the industry. And we have a lot of challenges in the railway industry going forward. And I, I'm trying to get, get us to actually understand those, put them together and, and work together with them is really important. So, and I, and I want to just explain a little bit about where we fit into PWI professional registration and CPD. It's great you're here and I hope that uh, you're gonna enjoy the session. So, Lunch and Learn, um, it's been going on a long time. Um, I've heard of it in many, in many organizations have been doing this, and it's basically a chance to spend about an hour um, listening to something interesting, and, and perhaps a little bit of feedback would be really good. And, and Lunch and Learn's been used by a lot of companies, specifically in terms of getting the staff together uh, and, and having a little get together as well. But, but we're doing this as a virtual thing. We'll continue doing it virtual for the rest of the year. Um, and we actually, we like to put a lot of effort into making sure there's a balance of different presentations as we go through. It will only be one hour. We'll start at 12.30 and we will finish at 1.30 UK time, uh, apart from the holidays. Uh, and all the details of the individual sessions are all shown in on the website. So if you go on the website, you'll find them all there. And we want to make sure there's a bit of chance of, uh, uh, of questions and answers. And also, we're looking for anybody who thinks that something that they've done or presented would be good going forward. So it, it's a continuously evolving process. So why are we doing it? Quite simple, there's my bunch of railway people. As I always say, a, a great picture, we're all different and we all come together but with one major aim that we want to spread knowledge and experience around this industry. That's why the PWI was formed all those years ago, well over 100 years ago, if you're not aware of that, because we've been training, we've been meeting for a long time, but the most important thing is that people want to pass this knowledge on. And, and it is a wide range of people as well, because we've not just got got people who are specific PWI members, they may be other people as well, but we, we cover such a vast part of the infrastructure side of the railway, uh, particularly the owners, the contractors, consultants, suppliers, educators, government agencies, and, and I'm very pleased that's what we're gonna start off with today. But a lot of these organizations are corporate members and we're expanding um, our links, but I've mentioned educators there, we're expanding our links now with universities and it won't be very long before 80 odd universities in the UK will have the PWI sign in, in their receptions because they'll, their courses will be accredited by the PWI and that's really good as part of our the, the understanding that we are there as a, as a national organisation. Just to put it into context, many of the people have presented before uh, in other types of uh, environments, and they're very keen to present again in a live environment. And this is what this is, a live environment. So there's a chance for questions. Now, obviously, as part of this process, um, we promote these as formal CPD. It's the formal CPD bit, which is important, but, we want to have fun, we want to enjoy this hour and hopefully, you know, get a little bit of interest about it, but let's just record it because CPD for, for people in the rail industry is really important for, for registration, etc. So make a note of what you've been doing. So let's get to the exciting bit. Um, what can you expect to see in these one hour sessions? Well, certainly, looking at you know high speed high speed lines we're going to be having some talks about that and all the, all the issues and, and and things we do there you can and you can see 
the the latest sort of thing is how do we look at the logistics of the railway work we do and it's amazing um how we've developed over the years and our our, our amazing competence in logistical management is fabulous when you're looking at you know a short amount of time and what we can actually deliver and the right hand side of well, of this particular slide if you're looking at is one of one of the one of the interesting things on development for electrification this is a cardiff intersection bridge so the specific infrastructure challenges particularly those that are multidisciplinary and that's what the point i'm trying to make here is that these these sessions are for all so we want as many people from different functions to be here and we do invite visitors to us and and uh, I did mention that you know we, we not everybody's a PWI member, you can be, but let's have operators and signalers and let's have everybody listening to what we've got to say. We've a lot to say. Now the the broadness of the of these sessions is very much about who is involved with with what we do. And I'm delighted that we've got Matt Gillen from the ORR, who is part of the engineering and asset management team. He will be giving a presentation about where the ORR is. Um, but if you're looking across this, this screen here, you'll see that there's a lot of stakeholders within the industry that link a lot with the PWI, uh, members of the PWI, and the point being that they have something to offer and they're doing projects. And this is all about you know, the, the enhancements of the railway, making it fit for the future. And we, what we need to do is to get our involvement with these organisations. So it's really, really good that, that we've managed to get good contact with them all. And, you know, when you look at the programme uh, for these sessions, you'll find a number of these are going to be presenting uh, as we go forward. Now, we want to make sure this is relevant. So there's lots of tricky issues going on within the industry at the moment um looking on the left there you know that's looks like a bit of a buckle or something there you know this is where we've got problems of, of managing the asset there's a structures one on the bottom left there uh this is where where we had a problem on the middle and middle and main line and you can see because it's one infrastructure there's a broken rail there there's there are issues to do with electrification but the main thing is that it's about the practical side of it. So some of these presentations will be practical and there's, there's a, a, a network rail tamper for you there. But it's amazing how people can do this sort of work with, with the emphasis on planning and logistics. So you can see you know, planning, logistics, data management. These are the new things we're looking for, particularly like digitization. So, I hope that you're going to enjoy that, some of those. Now we we also get quite technical here because you know this 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 particular um, diagram here we've got this this is a very complicated bit of S and C that's gone in and you can see you know there's a practical side of it on the pictures above and I, and and I'm quite pleased to see how many people can come across and explain how they did projects and some of the amazing projects that have gone on so expect to see you know fairly short presentations we're not talking long we've only got an hour on these sort of things so please come along and if you've got a project that you want to talk about let's have it as a presentation and we can all share it it'd be great so but that's what we've got a plan going forward and it's these complex design and delivery things we want to do now, there are, there are quite a lot of challenges, and I just want to broach this little bit for us, because what's going to happen to the railways post-COVID? I'm sure a lot of our speakers, especially from the government type of organisations, will have a comment on that. Um, and we've got to keep a heads-up position. You know, I, I think this is a really, really good time for the railways. Um, it's obvious that our roads are congested, and people will come back to it. In actual fact, leisure travel is coming back well. And, you know, the commuter side of it, it will, will have to change. I mean, we've still got a sort of government policy, can you work at home when you can? So 
the blended approach, I think, is going to be it. And I, I mean, it is interesting. Uh, nothing much to do with us, but interesting to see how our operating companies are looking at flexible tickets and that sort of thing. But the blended work of the efficiency of online stuff and meeting people is good. And looking at investment, it is not a bad time to be part of the railway because we are continuing with uh, approvals for investment on all around the country there's some very very good plans going forward and it's unlikely that there'll be less people working in this part of the industry so railway investment is very positive if we can demonstrate efficiency and service and i think when i hand over to matt in a minute those are the sort of things that will be sticking in his mind when he's when he's looking at it from that from that standpoint we we do know we can improve efficiency and we knew, do know that we can put passengers first. That's what Network Rail wants to say. But it's just a little picture down there. It's just amazing how we can do a project and, and, and sort of provide an amazing service. This is Kinlaw Station here last year. 28 trains, instantly open 28 trains a day. So I, it's a great place to be is the railway. Now, of course, um, we are faced with other challenges. and. You know, the climate emergency is something that we really are going to have to look at. I was watching on the news last night, there was, if you saw it, um, quite a lot of works being done and infrastructure, particularly rail infrastructure, was mentioned. So what are the challenges of, of, of keeping the infrastructure going with the climate emergency that we're in? A lot of it is to do with extreme weather and that's cold, hot, wind, you know the storms and all the rest of it um so that there's there, there will be a lot to do in that area and of course hopefully many of you will come to manchester in march and to our conference on this which i think would be really good and and i've i've come across some good some some good suggestions for mitigation and resilience measures you know the, the people are really really thinking out of the box what can you do to mitigate the problems of these of these extra extreme weather and obviously, on the more strategic approach, we've got decarbonisation as, as a key government policy and more electrification. And this leads me to my final point. Um, of course, professional registration. And I always say at this point, having gone through what we're trying to achieve and all the projects and work we do, that we, we want people to be on the journey with us. There's a picture of Nick, our president at the moment, and you know we are delighted to, to present people with these professional awards and i always say to any group of people whether it's a lunch and learn whether it's a training course whether it's um another meeting or conference or whatever everybody should be professionally registered be proud of your profession the railways everybody can be eng tech and you can move on to progression there's nothing better than, than having your awards presented by president so what we need to do is gain confidence and that's the final point i'm making here gain confidence as a rail engineer that you know these things so the confidence of having an experience like a lunch and learn it's just a pop in and, and it just tops up that knowledge and don't forget to record it in progress through the levels and if you're not a member of the pwi what value can you get for amazing journals that have, 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 have been looked upon in the industry and in the journal industry as probably some of the best so if you don't see the journal look at it there's some amazing articles in there enjoy it and membership is is, is only 90 pounds so i finished my bit so i've i hope that's been useful for people to understand the lunch and learn process i think I, we're looking for questions if you've got any questions or contributions on lunch and learn then please let us know uh, please enjoy it have some fun um in the in the next session so what we'll do is i'll, I'll hand straight over to matt um and then if you've got any questions for me i can be you can uh, pop them in the box if you want to or say I want to ask you a specific question and we'll deal with those towards the end of the session. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that reasonably 
uh, interesting and, and, and know where we're going in terms of lunch and learn. So I will stop sharing now. Um, that's great. We've got 85 people, which is amazing. So 85 people, thank you very much for turning up today. So I'm delighted to welcome Matt Gillen, who has been an amazing supporter of the PWI. Um, he's been on lots of courses with us. He, he's visited various events and all the rest of it. Um, it's really good to see that you know Matt and he's part of a, a larger team spend a lot of time talking to people on the ground. They spend a lot of time talking to uh, the organisations that they're regulating. And I'm really pleased to have him on board. So uh, without further ado, Matt, I'd like to, I'd like you to start off and, and tell us about the ORR. And where, but more importantly, where is it going in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, just to confirm, can you see that okay? Before I crack on. Yeah, we can see that, no problem. Perfect, okay, I'll start then. Uh, so thank you very much, welcome to everyone. Um, thank you for having me in the first PWI Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm gonna be giving an introduction to the ORR, as Brian says, and um, a little bit of an overview of maybe where we're going and things like that. Uh, so I'm Matt Gillen, I'm civil engineer at the ORR. I work in the engineering and asset management team, as Brian mentioned. Uh, I'm, I'm very much focused on the track asset. Uh, we have people that cover kind of all the disciplines, but uh, tracks where I'm at. Uh, I've been with the ORR for nearly four years now, um, and I've been enjoying every minute of it. Uh, so jumping straight in, oh, hello. let me just make sure this works. There we are. Um, so what do we do? Just a bit of an overview. So at the heart of it, ORR, we protect the interests of rail and road users. Um, so we seek to improve safety, value, performance of railways and roads today and in the future. And uh, within that, we have kind of eight core constituents. Um, so most people will know we, we are the, the kind of safety regulator. So we keep Britain's railways safe. Uh, we hold network rail to account. Um, we are um, protecting consumer interests. Uh, we advise and assist the government on rail type issues, um, including kind of funding requirements and so on and so forth. Uh, we have quite clear requirements around providing clear information on funding and industry performance. Um, we kind of have a, we have statisticians and everything that produce a lot of data, um, but particularly the, the public seems to love it, particularly things around kind of, you know, most and least popular use stations and so on like that. Um, uh, we also regulate high speed one route and the channel tunnel. Um, we have requirements around um, ensuring fair access to the rail network for both kind of passenger and freight companies. And all while we kind of keep markets under review, such as the kind of big cycling market study that's been undertaken recently. Um, I also just give a bit of a nod to the roads element of ORR. Um, so uh, the much smaller team, there's only, I think, 17 people on last count, um, but they have quite um, a key role in monitoring of Highways England, or uh, it's National Highways now, I think. Uh, so they kind of monitor the performance, uh, user satisfaction, uh, securing value for money, and similarly advise and assist on government on road issues, which um, can be quite headline grabbing stuff, as you can imagine sometimes. So uh, who are we? So ORR, uh, essentially we're broken down into six directorates. Um, I myself sit in the railway planning and performance um, and highways, sorry, can't forget them, um, in the top left corner there. Uh, uh, most people will also know the Railway Safety Directorate, um, which is where all of our uh, inspector chums sit, um, led by Ian Prosser. Um, but we also have directorates around economics, markets and strategy. Um, we have kind of legal competition services, um, uh, communications uh, type people, and then you know, corporate operations who make sure that we uh, work effectively as an organization. Um, so we're about 300 strong. I think that's a bit of an old count. Um, I think we're a slightly larger than that now, um, to the tune of 33 million in 2018-19. Um, uh, it was the best guesstimate on railway health and safety. I think it's slightly larger than that now. This is a slightly old number, but approximately 120 full-time staff. Um, engineering and asset management, that's where I sit. We have 36 full-time equivalents. Um, and specifically within the ORR civils team, we have nine staff. Um, we're based all over the UK, and so six offices ranging all the way kind of from London to Glasgow. Uh, so what do I do? Uh, or more specifically, where do I sit? So my deputy director, um, so he covers engineering, asset management, 
plus a couple of other bits it's Steve Fletcher and under him we have six people uh, the head of uh, various assets, planning enhancement, interoperability, rail vehicles, asset management. Um, I've highlighted Dermot Kelly, uh, head of civil engineering, as many people probably know him, um, he's a long-standing PWI member, uh, and that's the team that I sit on. Uh, I thought I'd just highlight some of the kind of improved capabilities that we've, we've employed since uh, the start of CP6, kind of recognizing the requirements. Um, so head of asset management, that's actually a relatively new role, has been reinstated. Um, within that, we've actually got a lot more kind of improved asset management capability and also more recently uh, taken on sustainable development engineer, um, kind of uh, as Brian previously, uh, Brian previously mentioned, the, the climate emergency and really to get on top of uh, being able to monitor and regulate that. And also within the civil engineering team in the last few months, we've also taken on a on-track machine engineer. Um, someone to look at all those big bits of yellow plant that roll around um, and make sure they're being used efficiently and properly. And also building services engineer, um, because we actually have the operational property portfolio within civil engineering, um, but there's a recognition that obviously, as time's moved on and things become more accessible, there's a lot more lifts, escalators, so on and so forth. And we needed someone to be able to kind of help provide expertise on that area. Uh, so it just circled, uh, yep, civil engineering, that's where I am. Um, and our four key roles. So we've got holding network rail to account for the conditions within the network license, uh, determining efficient levels of funding, which is primarily done through the periodic reviews, which I'll briefly touch on. Uh, we hold accountability for authorization of submissions under interoperability regs. Um, so whilst we have a head of interoperability and rail vehicles over here, um, the different disciplines cover certain areas. So the civil engineering team will cover kind of station type submissions, which look at um, infrastructure type elements. And we also provide technical advice across the ORR, whether that be kind of, we work quite closely with our safety colleagues and inspectors, whether that be the kind of people looking at the national perspective or uh, more kind of regional focused, um, and also work with uh, kind of economists and so on, um, into being able to determine the right level of funding. So why do we do it? Um, I, I thought this is a really nice little graph. I've um, feed from Network Rails. Uh, unfortunately, didn't have the, the latest year, but uh, it's a nice snapshot of 1920. Um, as I said, I focus on track. So if we look at the kind of track portfolio, we're, we're approaching near a billion pounds spent on track renewals in 1920 and over 700 million uh, spent in maintenance in 1920. I think the um, this year is actually probably over a billion for uh, track renewals. So really just to emphasize and refocus that we're talking significant amount of money here it really justifies a kind of practice level of assurance and third party regulation um so how do we hold to account um i'm just going to give a brief overview of this i know it's quite a busy uh, slide uh so this is our kind of pyramid of regulation uh effectively we work from the bottom up um so we we have a kind of procedure of going through routine monitoring assessment which is effectively the day job um, investigation and early resolution, which kind of specific type works, and then going up to enforcement. So just to briefly touch on those, so routine monitoring assessment, it's really just, as it says there, understanding network rails performance and the strength of their accountability. Um, this is kind of using slightly old terminology, but it's more regional focus now. Um, this came out at the start of CP6, not post uh, PPVFF. Um, uh, so how do we do that? Uh, we do a lot of route benchmarking. Um, regions all have uh, specific scorecards that they are held against um, with uh, targets that uh, people get across if they don't meet. Um, there's also regulatory minimum flaws, um, which kind of align with certain metrics that, you know, if performance goes under certain levels, um, it raises cause for concern. Um, and we also kind of monitor against the, the requirements set out in the periodic reviews. Um, and then on the other side, we have things around accountability, like we kind of assess regularly the, the government's arrangements in network rail. Uh, we, we discuss a lot with kind of uh, the you know regional leads and technical authority and so on. Um, and then also just like the quality of information that they provide us. Um, so we, we cover quite a, a breadth of information uh, in success on um, a quite frequent per, um, a basis. Uh, going up the pyramid, so when we identify issues, we kind of have a, a procedure for investigation and early resolution before we have to do any enforcement. So typically this kind of involves more in-depth in, uh, gathering of information. Um, we have 
frameworks for independent reporters, as we call them, which are effectively um, agreed third party consultants that will go in and investigate certain areas on behalf of both us and Network Rail. Um, so it's a, an agreed process. Um, but we also have kind of new powers, kind of having formal improvement plans, um, ORR led hearings. I'm not sure actually any of those have been done necessarily, but they, they are within our powers. And then going right to the top, um, if there is kind of critical license breaches and you know uh, things are pretty bad, um, we do have uh, certain levels of enforcement. We have enforcement orders, kind of financial sanctions and penalties. Um, I will just draw the line there as well. People hear ORR enforcement, they probably think prohibition notices and um, improvement plans, and uh, which are the kind of safety uh, type of issues um, of enforcement. Um, a very different process. Uh, they, they have their own processes and procedures for um, managing those. Uh, this is specifically talking around us holding network rail to account against their network license. Um, so nice picture of an escalator. Uh, just referencing our, we have a, a thing called the regulatory escalator, which is one of the key tools that we use for holding network rail to account. Um, effectively, it's the, uh, the way that we highlight issues internally and escalate them up to our very senior management. So kind of our CEO, John Larkinson, has kept abreast of things. Um, uh, effectively, it's a, an issue that's identified, goes to a panel of people, um, it's given a score for severity, and then it goes on a register that is freely shared with Network Rail and opens up correspondence on you know, how we're going to deal with this issue. Um, such examples that have been on there in recent times are things like uh, track geometry was on there for a number of years, requiring kind of improvement plans from each of the routes at the time, um, on specific things like repeat twists, uh, which has all been managed and dealt with so far. Um, and they all came off a couple of years ago and also things like uh, vegetation management was on there for a number of years um, requiring network rail to really kind of get their act together at the time and get our proper plans in place to to manage their vegetation which was you know, getting a bit out of control at the time and I think I can't say it's only but yeah I think they're in a much better place than they were now and uh, that's all contained in a policy um, so that policy is freely available on our website so I thought I'd just post it in there. Um, it is out of date now, but um, it still holds true for CP6. So specifically to engineering and asset management, um, we have a process for going in and doing our kind of routine monitoring and assessment. Um, so we have a, a process called the targeted assurance review process. Um, so as it says there, we undertake targeted assurance reviews or TARS as we call them to gain in-depth understanding on to ongoing and emerging issues, risks, opportunities within Network Rail, which could impact their regulatory targets. Um, and very much deciding what those tasks are going to be. It's, we do it on a kind of annual basis. We decide what the plan is going to be for the year ahead, and we try and stick to that as best we can. Um, but we really have to challenge ourselves when we do do them that, you know, is it worth it? Is it a real issue? And can we actually influence it? Because we, we don't want to waste our time doing something that we, we can't change the outcome of. Um, and we all have to consider that in the context of you know, risk, safety and economics. And hopefully when it goes through that kind of sausage machine, uh, we get kind of choice targets of assurance reviews. Um, more or less, we get a couple per asset per year. Um, and just to flip through some of the ones that we have done in the past couple of years. Um, so there was one on drainage maintenance. We've had earthworks and drainage weather resilience. This is obviously a very topical subject. OLE incident response. I think that was um, in response to the, the the incidents a couple of years ago, um, in the very hot summer, lots of DUI events. Um, the operational property deferred renewal and work bank change control management. That's a bit of a mouthful, but um, structured examination. Uh, and a couple that I've done the past year uh, around stone blowers. So we're looking at the, the new fleet that Network Rail are procuring and just trying to ensure that there's kind of value for money and so on and so forth. And also a bit tangential from that, we, we took a view on the, the management track geometry by on track machines. Um, so all these reports, we actually publish them all online now. Um, it is a new process. Uh, so we publish them online. We really encourage people to go out and read them and um, really welcome feedback. Uh, so if you do have a chance to go and look at a subject that you might be interested in, uh, we'd be more than happy to have a conversation around it and hear what you think. So where does that all lead towards? Um, so annually we um, produce a, uh, an assessment of Network Rail. Um, it used to be called the Network Rail Monitor, for those that may know. Um, and I thought I'd just summarise what 2020-21 said. So ultimately, trains during the pandemic were punctual 
punctual and reliable. So CRMP and FDMR, I, just, I can't remember what they mean off the top of my head, but they are effectively the main metrics for managing um, passenger train performance and freight train performance. They're both better than target, trains are on time. Um, I think we commended the approach to timetabling by Network Rail and saw good collaboration between regions and tots and bots. Um, uh, but really just selling the message that, you know, we really must have retained the focus and whilst the performance has improved now, we recognise that, you know, we don't want to lose all those gains. And um, uh, there's a lot of good learning from the pandemic that we should take forward and make sure we don't forget. And then Network Rail, uh, on track with cost savings. So we're talking around efficiency targets primarily here. Uh, so Network Rail have quite stringent efficiency targets set upon them. Um, all regions met those. Uh, they remain confident to deliver the overall challenge, which is 3.5 billion over the control period. Um, the, the couple of concerns, uh, something around Scotland's plans to deliver future efficiencies. Uh, I can't comment much more on that, but I think that is being resolved. And uh, risk funds lower than expected, but in fairness, we went through a pandemic um, and there were additional costs that weren't foreseen. Uh, I won't spend too much time on the, the safety point because it's, it's really not my area, but um, obviously the further improvements in safety being required, uh, noting there are three workers dying in 2020, uh, really demonstrates the further improvements needed to improve workforce safety. And also um, very critically highlighting the need um, through things such as Carmont uh, just over a year ago now um, on the impacts of climate change and more understanding um, of what that means for us in the future. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, headlines there, vital engineering works delivered, um, but there are areas for improvement. This kind of sits within the, the asset portfolio. So main, maintenance and enhancements largely delivered on time. Asset performance, as kind of highlighted by train performance and freight performance, has been very good during the pandemic. And uh, delivery asset renewals has been good or higher. Um, expected in some regions. i uh, caveat that by saying track renewals is a, an interesting one and um, we see a lot of in escalating costs. Materials are a lot more expensive than they used to be and it is something we are um, watching very carefully. Um, and then last but not least, uh, there, there was kind of areas of improvement, so greater focus improvements needed for Network Rail's reporting of maintenance. Um, Network Rail have uh, started doing a lot more insurance and improvement in that area um, and then also uh, completion of structures examinations which I think refers to a, a backlog of examinations in some regions and improving drainage asset knowledge which has been a, a very long-standing item but effectively getting network rail to a place where they know where each and all their drainage assets really are and how to manage them properly. Um, and I thought I'd just kind of follow on from that with just a, a snapshot for this audience on uh, you know what do the incident delays look like due to track assets? So this is very much information that we look at. This is a snapshot from our um, asset dashboard. Um, just to give a, a bit of an explanation, the, the top um, graph on the left-hand side there is, is looking at the delay minutes associated to track, uh, track faults. And the graph on the bottom is the number of incidents associated with that, uh, broken down by region as for the color scheme there. Um, as you can see, March 2020, everything significantly improved. Um, and you can't quite see where 2021, 2022 uh, begins. Things were ticking along very nicely, hence the, the, the previous review. But since then, things have started to deteriorate a little bit. And we, we're very keen. Obviously, the, the numbers of trains have been increasing and we have been returning to a, a greater degree, deal of normality. But as I previously said, we, we just don't want to make sure we keep as many of the good practices and benefits that we saw from uh, the pandemic that we can. So a major part of um, our role as well, I, I briefly touched on was the interoperability authorizations. So headline there is um, new major upgrade and renewed infrastructure and rolling stock uh, basically has to come through us for a, an authorization before being placed into service. And I thought I'd just snap some of the ones that have been done in the past couple of years. Um, these are the ones I just found on Twitter anyway. Uh, so Stevenage Station, uh, we had Bow Street Station was one of the ones I, I had the pleasure of authorizing and um, CERM station uh, more recently. And then a couple of projects, or a few rather, uh, that have been going on or are ticking away for the future. Um, we've got the Elizabeth Line cross rail, as you'll know it. Um, we're working away with them at the moment, um, making some good progress. Have to announce that actually had the first London Underground station authorised yesterday, which is a good positive, a good stepping stone for um, the station authorizations. 
Um, we've got TRU somewhere in the future and TFW's kind of core value lines um, that we're, we're in early engagement with those projects for. Um, obviously, there's a lot more else going around the network, but I just thought I'd call out a few of the bigger ones. And then just a final note to um, some of the guidance that we've released in the last six months. So we have a, a new guidance online uh, around kind of the approach to interoperability authorization. Uh, so there's guidance for the applicants. It kind of sets out our views on how people should approach um, authorization and um, very much reinforcing the, the requirement for um, kind of early engagement and you know keeping us abreast of issues before before deadlines um so yeah that that's on there i thought i'd just pump it out there um also that's as i said relatively new and always welcome for feedback once again so please do get in touch if you have any thoughts or feelings and then a brief look into the future um the one thing on everyone's mind in the RR at the moment is probably pr23 um I had a little red arrow there, but it seems to have disappeared. Um, we're obviously at the start of 2022 at the moment. Um, Network Rail are scurrying away, making lots of different plans for many different scenarios and so on and so forth, kind of building their work banks for CP7. Um, we've had sight on some of those, but you know, obviously it's waiting for the full picture. Um, so yeah, the, uh, a couple of the major milestones that I'd probably point out is later this year, we'll have the um, uh, high level output specification and um, statement of funds available, which basically um, the Secretary of State and Scottish Ministers saying, you know, what they want us to do or what they want Network Rail to do and how much they have to do it. And then ultimately that culminating in the um, strategic business plans being published by Network Rail um, early in 2023 which kicks off a very intensive period for the ORR, I would say, uh, for scrutinizing those business plans, um, where that ultimately uh, results in us publishing a draft determination for both England, Wales and Scotland, um, which sets out our thoughts and feelings. Um, and then that starts a whole other level of consultation between ORR, Network Rail, all other third parties, anyone else really, um, which culminates in the final determination and then finally, Network Rail's final delivery plans. Um, so yeah, a busy times ahead, basically. And then a very quick nod to GBR. Um, I won't say much because I don't know a lot. Um, my director, uh, Graham Richards, actually just got seconded over to into the transition team. So we know in RR that we're quite well represented, oh, represented rather. Um, but yeah, um, obviously recognizing that there's this this big beast working in the background and significant changes in the future. But I think the overarching message for us at the moment is that the day job is staying the same. Um, we can't forget what we need to do. And um, PR23, as far as we're concerned, is basically going ahead as it always was. Um, I mean, there is a line there saying, you know, timeline may change to adapt as the implementation plan becomes clearer, but we are proceeding as planned. Um, and we don't see any risks to this kind of process in the near future. And then given that this is a lunch and learn, I thought I'd touch a little bit on CPD. Um, so the, the two graphics on the screen there are very much just the, the frameworks that are set out. I think the top one's from the civil service um, uh, learning framework. And the one on the left-hand side, as it says there, is the, the regulatory competencies framework. Um, so I guess the point I'd say is, Obviously, sitting in a regulatory role, um, RR, we actually have a lot of emphasis on CPD, at least within my area. Um, we we really require staff to be aware of what's going on in the industry. Um, we can sometimes be a bit removed from the actual day-to-day -day management of the railway, and so the way part of the way to fill that deficit is to um, undertake CPD um, ultimately. Um, but it does very much come down to identifying the needs of the individuals. We have a very diverse set of people in the ORR, I'd say, for the organisation side. Um, lots of people at different stages in their careers, and we have lots of different people from different backgrounds. Um, you know, I think ORR pretty much covers everything. In our directorate alone, we have engineers, we have asset managers, we have you know, data analytics people, we have operations people. It, it's quite significant. They, the, the degree of variability. And there's lots of different frameworks for different people. Uh, I think that's very well recognized. I mean, um, all our uh, safety inspectors all go through the IOSH framework. Um, I think CERO is uh, Chartered Institute of Railway Operators, unless I'm mistaken. 
Um, but we also have, you know, more commonplace people, ones that people on this call know, like ICE, that we, some of us work towards. Um, and then I, I, last point there, I thought I'd just point it out, um, that RSD, so that's the, the Railway Safety Directorate, and the inspectors in particular have quite a defined competence framework that I'm aware of, um, which kind of satisfies both the technical and regulatory, um, and they need both effectively. And that's in recognition of the fact that you probably have two different types of people coming into the inspectorate. Um, those that kind of come from the HSD and probably more savvy on the regulatory, but don't have that technical competence of the railway and familiarity, or um, I suppose it, um, uh, uh, on the other side, you'd have the technical people that come from the railway environment and wouldn't be as clued up on the, the regulatory side. So yeah, uh, necessary to satisfy both. And then last but not least, final slide for me, um, uh, just a bit of a summary of some of the stuff we do do in the ORR to encourage CPD. Um, we have lots of bite-sized seminars, which are not dissimilar from the concept of a lunch and learn, just someone comes along and talks about a subject really, um, whether that be internal or external. Uh, there's actually one on at the moment, which a bit died about missing around um, climate change and weather resilience, which I think someone from Network Rail has come along to present. But we've had other things like how to support good mental health, uh, things in the signaling market study, network growth scorecards, and we even had Brian come along and give a, a bit of an introduction to BWI a few months ago, which much appreciated. Um, we also have things like knowledge sharing clubs, uh, initially started as a get everyone clued up on digital railways type thing, but uh, evolved over time and is now kind of a periodic um, seminar that um, someone generally comes along and talks about um, a certain subjects and they're very interesting. Uh, and then I, I thought I'd just highlight a couple of the um, bits of training that we've done in civil team as well. So a few things we've done in the last year, we've a few of us got accredited with the IAM and done ISO 55000 training. Um, we've done a bit of training on AI and engineering awareness, just kind of a, a bit of a nod to something that might be, um, and just gaining a bit of familiarity. Um, some people have done things that kind of complement uh, the bit of work they do. So people are doing a bit of work on like bridge design training. And um, uh, one of my colleagues did a course on tree survey and inspection, um, and she's accountable for some of the line side elements in ORR. Um, and then my own, I thought I'd given that I'm at the PWI, um, I should mention some of the courses I've done with the PWI, as Brian alluded to earlier. I did the SNC refurbishment course a couple of years ago. Um, I really recommend that, that was really good. Um, off the back of that, I actually did a, a assurance review into SNC refurbishment um, for Network Rail. And at the moment, actually halfway through the electrification engineering. Um, so I did mod one a few months ago and I'm actually going to mod two next week. So looking forward to that. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I hope that leaves enough time for questions. Um, I put my email address on there. I'm always keen to get out and talk to people. So please feel free to get in contact if you if you have anything you, you fancy discussing or anything like that. One of our kind of key goals is to actually build up a bit better relationship with some aspects of industry. So always keen to chat um, and then I think I'm going to hand over to Joan just for the final slide. Thank you, thank you very much Matt, thank you Matt and Brian for both of your presentations and um, we're just finishing up now so we've got time left for questions so I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about myself and my role and um, so I joined the PWI as a membership director in the autumn of last year and um, my job is obviously to strengthen the membership in terms of numbers, but also of equal importance to make sure that the members that we do have um, feel that they're getting what they want from the membership um, and that our offering suits their needs. So always very keen to hear from existing members. And just to, to recap on some of the benefits of the membership, um, obviously we have section meetings. Every member belongs to a section, that's their home place. Um, and they run many uh, meetings through the course of the year. We offer a number of technical conferences and the journal as well throughout the year, which Brian's mentioned already. Um, and then moving on to formal training, um, we have the track engineering diploma, the OLE diploma that Matt has just mentioned that he's undertaken at the minute, the SNC refurbishment course. And you'll see a point there on the slide that the courses are face-to-face -face, or they can be virtual or indeed we're now getting requests from um, organizations to undertake training specific for them for example Hong Kong MTR 
um, Brian's in the middle of doing some training for them now. Very important um, is professional registration. We became accredited in 2019 and we can offer professional registration at Technician Incorporated and Chartered level. And currently, since 2019, we now have a pool of about 250 people who have become professionally registered through the PWI. In terms of the electronic world, um, we're about to launch our new website. So that will be, um, that's been long awaited and we're all very excited about that. And that has quite a lot of focus on um, technical knowledge hub information contained within that website, which we hope will be a huge member benefit. But I think most of all for me, um, being a member of the PWI, you are part of an inclusive railway community. You have access to people with knowledge and experience who just love to share that um, and to spread their knowledge and to help people to learn. And as Brian mentioned earlier on, all this for less than £100 a year. Um, I think it's a very good value for money. And um, I think I've said enough now about the benefits of the membership. So we'll just have time now for some questions. I'll hand back to you, Brian. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, I'm just going to try a bit of a new thing on this. So I'm going to ask Ashish to ask his question, please, if you'd like to unmute yourself and you want to ask a question. Ashish, are you able to talk? You've got a couple of things in the... Um... Yes. Uh, Who are you, Ashish? Yes, good afternoon. Me? Hi, this this side, Ashish here. And I wanted to ask uh, Matthew about uh, the weak factors of network rail where uh, they are lagging on the asset management capabilities can you help me with that i know it's a kind of personal question but um yeah it's a bit, a bit of a difficult one to answer off the cuff i'd say um <laughs> Uh, I would say that there the, there was a kind of at, at the start of CP6 we did a quite a de well we had AMCL do a detailed kind of asset management um, investigation mm -hmm. on our behalf and go in and assess all the elements of network rails so they went around to the, kind of all different regions and spoke to lots of different people and went away and assessed all their capabilities in different areas um, um, things have changed since then obviously um, it's been a few years. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I don't think I can answer that question <laughs> as specifically mm -hmm. as it, you might like. No, it, uh, um, uh, asset said, management kind of... obviously <laughs> have think... a very big, very big scope in each and every sector. So yeah. it's it's a very big sector. Like we deal in uh, asset management into uh, maintenance sector. So that's why I wanted to know your uh, idea, what you have observed that they are spending yeah. money in this sector or not or they should I learn mean, more my, yeah oh sorry i was just going to say from my view obviously um one of the things we push for quite um quite a lot uh, with uh, network rail on the track side is the the kind of track competency frameworks that they they're rolling out and things like that um Good. and that, that's starting to filter down to maintenance a lot more and i think an aspect of that is asset management um as you kind of say mass maintenance are probably less concerned well i don't want to say they're not concerned but um you know you'd expect the asset managers in the organization to be more clued up on asset management than maintenance might be um who are obviously dealing with a day-to-day -day running but um yeah th that's one of the ways we kind of follow up with it um is seeing the filtration of that competence framework and it's something we right. monitor regularly thank you for your answer and it was I, I, great i think you just add a little bit of that to matt i mean in, in german distance i did work for the oro <laughs> but I, I it's just about asset management is is got best practice to it and i think that's one of the things that we are you know some areas some some in some places it it, it seems to work in others it doesn't and i think it's just i think it's, it's a very complicated area uh, and it's something that the Peter Bryan can help with, I think, in terms of training. And it, there's a lot of research involved in it. And it, it's it's a moving feast because it all, it all relates to future traffic patterns and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it is a tricky area. And, and it's something that whatever happens in the future, it, we're going to concentrate on a lot. And I'm sure the ORR will help us with it. Thank you, Ashish, for that one. That's good. Um, can we just 
does John Dolan want to ask his question, please? Of course, Brian, you're oh. not going to shut me up easy, are you? As long as you don't make it too long. <laughs> no, no, it's basically on the lines that's on the, on the thing. Uh, just to say that Matt's made no mention of the OR role in respect of London Underground, DLR and light rail. And just to put that into context, the ORR's passenger figures for 1920, the last full proper year, shows there were actually as many passengers on Croydon tram as to, from and in the whole of the railways in Wales. So it's a huge sector that's not really been mentioned so far. Um, in part, that's deliberate um, because we're, from where I sit, we um, our responsibility lies solely with Network Rail, um, and that's who we regulate through their network license. London Underground, um, metros, they work within different frameworks. There are safety, um, the safety regulation um, over that, but that's not in the area that I work, so I don't want to comment on things that I don't know and can't answer with confidence. Um, so yeah, we, we don't have that role that we do for network rail in London Underground, DLR, light rail, for instance. Um, and yeah, things like London Underground sit within the, the TFL framework, you know, accountable to the London Mayor. So it's a slightly different setup. Hmm. Well, but who we, knows we, it we, might change. Who knows it might change in the future? <laughs> Can we go Brian, on perhaps, it, perhaps that would make a very good another topic for another lunch and learn, looking into that. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you, John, there, because, I mean, one of the things that Peter Bry is trying to do, sorry to keep chipping in, Matt, <laughs> but one of the Peter, things Peter Bry is trying to do is is to, you know, is, is to look at the integration of the industry, the low, you know, the light rail, DLR, London Underground, et cetera, the other tram systems. And in fact, we're having a talk about tram systems soon. So the PWI, for anybody who's listening in, the PWI isn't Network Rail and TFL. It's all all other organizations as well and other railways, including Heritage. So, you know, we we and any we, we will look at our list of stuff for that. And it'd be and we'll, um, perhaps we will well we can easily have put some more presentations forward. We've got some good people particularly in London Underground, who'd be keen to spread some of their knowledge. It's quite good that we're working together. Um, is Tony McGarney still there? Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, firstly, Matt, just wanted to say thanks. Great presentation, found it really interesting. Um, my question was around HS2. I saw on your slides you mentioned that you were looking after the regulation of HS1. I was just wondering if you've been involved in any conversations in the way the money's being spent and, and indeed where it's being spent in the early sort of knockings of HS2. I haven't personally, and I don't think ORR has much of a role in that. I know certain people are kind of involved with kind of safety by design and elements like that um, and providing expertise in that area, but I think we have more of a role once it's effectively built, <laughs> like HS1, yeah. and so we monitor it. And our role in HS1 is a very different role than it is from Network Rail, I would clarify. You know, we kind of do that periodic review in a similar manner, but um, ultimately the, the the framework and the way it's set up, HS1 is a different beast. It's a you know, private company running a railway as opposed to um, the, the public entity that is Network Rail being given a load of money. Um, so yeah, I, I I can say with confidence that no one's in, uh, involved, but uh, I'm not, um, and I know some people are, but I don't think it's necessarily on the the, the way money is being spent. Um, so yeah, I'm afraid I can't answer it confidently. No worries. Cheers, Matt. Thank you. I'm sure there's a lot. I'm sure there'll be. I'm sure there'll be a lot of links there between because there's a lot, huge number of people in Network Rail working for the interface between between Network Rail and HS2, Tony. I'm, I'm sure there are lots. But it's a good. It's a good subject, and I think we'll uh, we'll 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 put it on our list. But thank you very much, Tony, for that for that question. Uh, go on to Paul Abbott. Do you want to ask your question? Oh, thanks very much, Brian. Hello, Tony. Uh, Matthew, that was very um, helpful. Thank you very much. Can I just clarify that uh, ORR are reviewing the performance of Network Rail in terms of delivery of projects, in particular, I'm thinking about cost, value for money, overheads, uh, because there's lots of criticism, uh, certainly in government and locally, for where I live, 
we're looking at community projects and everyone sort of rubbishes the delivery of a, a network rail, the railway industry delivery of projects. And of course, Elizabeth line doesn't help, which is a, a TFL project. Yeah, um, uh, there's multiple ways you could probably take that question, I suppose. Because uh, uh, I mean, I initially thought you might be referring to project speed, um, which is obviously the big government incentive to kind of reduce costs and um, deliver projects faster, which is something that we are supporting. Um, uh, particularly things like even down to my level, we, we're looking at kind of how, how authorizations work in practice and how we could make that process more fluid and so on. Um, but then we also have things like one of the things I didn't delve into too much, but part of the, the our team at the the um, RR, so the engineering and asset management, we have um, uh, enhancements and um, planning team. Um, and so within that, there are a number of project managers who are kind of accountable for uh, keeping tabs on all the enhancements around the country um, and kind of reporting back on those and trying to review how Network Rail or whatever entity it might be are delivering that with respect to kind of value for money. Um, so I think the the question, the answer is yes. Uh, it's probably just being delivered in kind of various different forms. Um, we do a lot of benchmarking, uh, kind of you say comparing to other railways. Um, you know, uh, the economists in um, ORR are often publishing reports on kind of benchmarking different views between each other, or we have done uh, things in the past of comparing, um, you know, costs to other similar railways. Um, but those are few and far between and more um, off um, bespoke projects rather than kind of, um, just regular re reporting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, there's, I think we've had some good questions there. So thank you very much for, for everybody. I, I just do a little sum up. I mean, I, I, I did mention in my opening uh, introduction to this Lunch and Learn that, you know, the most important thing about us sitting here on this call is how can we look at the efficiency and how can we look at the service to the, the passenger? And those are two areas which we mostly get criticised on as a railway. So, and we all know that there are things we can do. Um, it's not simple, but it's just useful to have other people looking at it. And I think it's really good with the ORR uh, because it's full of practical people. And uh, I, I mean, uh, Matt works for a guy called Dermot uh, Kelly, who, who, uh, who we, we know in the PWI well. And, you know, that team, um, you know, I've got a lot to offer to the rail, rail industry together. So if there's any, there may be changes going on in the future. Nobody's asked what's happening in GB railways. And it was quite, I thought there might have been a question on that, Matt. But, you know, people know that's possibly going to change. But it's not going to change the role in terms of what the PWI does in terms of how we can work together. Uh, and I hope you've, everybody who's been here today has found that interesting in the lunch and learn session. So please come again. Uh, and um, but most of all give us some feedback what did you like about today we tried a different style with allowing people to ask questions which you wanted to do because i always wanted to think this is a live event and it isn't just a recording so um please come to another one please suggest other things we can do and uh hopefully see quite a lot of you next week and next week is uh the 25th of january at half past 12 again and we're going to have Jonathan Graham with us, who many of us know from our PDRI connections. He works for the RAIB, um, a, a, a very practical railway man. And um, he will be certainly um, challenging us from, from, the, from, from a diff slightly different perspective in terms of learning from where things have not gone quite right. So I look forward to seeing you all in a, in a week's time. Have a good week. And don't forget to give us some feedback. Thank you very much indeed for coming. And thanks very much, Matt. Much appreciated. Thanks.